From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. Could there have been any human creatures, commonly called pre-Adamites, living on earth before God created Adam? Many readers, no doubt, will think that this is a foolish question, but it is, in fact, the belief of many evangelicals. And leading progressive creationist Hugh Ross teaches something similar that he says, bipedal tool using large-brained primates roamed Earth for hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million years. Ross does not believe in biological evolution, although he accepts cosmic and geologic evolution and the evolutionary timescale. He also believes in the same general sequences of events in the same order of appearance as evolutionists. Although he believes that God made Adam from the dust, he also accepts the evolutionist's long-gauge interpretation of the fossil record. But human fossils are found dated earlier than Adam's genealogies could possibly allow. This requires Ross to postulate the existence of creatures with human-like characteristics, but spiritless. Ross says, These creatures were extinct before Adam and Eve came on the scene. Why did they become extinct? According to Ross, because the world was a place of death, violence, and decay for hundreds of thousands if not millions of years before the curse recorded in Genesis 3, 14 through 19. He makes the extraordinary statement, the step-by-step approach to bipedal primate creation that we can see in the recent fossil record may reasonably reflect God's understanding of the difficulty other life forms would encounter in adapting to sinful humans. This is a classic example of the confusion that Christians get themselves into when they depart from the text of the Bible and allow outside influences, especially long-age naturalism, to dictate the meaning of Scripture. In 1655, Frenchman Isaac La Pirea published his theory that not only did Adam come from pre-Adamic stock, rather than being formed by God from the dust of the ground, but also Cain's wife and the inhabitants of Cain's city came from other pre-Adamic stock. In the 18th and 19th centuries, because white and non-white people looked superficially different, a minority of Christians thought that God had created non-whites separately from Adam, and so they must have descended from pre-Adamic creatures. Hence, pre-Adamism took the form of polygenism, or multiple creations of different races. Proponents of this idea often thought that non-whites were inferior beings who could be treated as slaves. Pre-Adamism thus became the scientific justification for slavery, and a defense for racism. Pre-Adamites were also an integral part of the now-discredited gap theory. In this, the pre-Adamites were soulless beings, which all perished in a catastrophe called Lucifer's Flood, which allegedly occurred between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 1, quote, in the far distant dateless past. In the 20th century, with the rise of Darwinism and the continued discovery of allegedly very old human-like fossils, many evangelicals compromised by adopting theistic evolution. They accepted a relatively young age for the biblical Adam, if they retained belief in him at all, but said that the old human fossils came from pre-Adamite human-like creatures. One such neo-evangelical was Londoner John R. W. Stott, who also compromises the Bible's teaching on eternal conscious punishment for the unsaved because it offends his sensibilities. He wrote, My acceptance of Adam and Eve as historical is not incompatible with my belief that several forms of pre-Adamic hominid seem to have existed for thousands of years previously. It is conceivable that God created Adam out of one of them. I think you may even call some of them Homo sapiens. Pre-Adamism has thus been used by some Christians to try and harmonize science and the Bible. However, in doing this, Stott and his fellow thinkers not only add something to Genesis that's not there, that is, pre-Adamites, they also deny Genesis 2-7, which specifically says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. The very dust to which Adam would return after God had pronounced the death penalty for sin. Pre-Adamism of this type is also starkly contrary to what Genesis tells us about Eve, 
namely that God made her from one of Adam's ribs, not from some pre-existing creature. It also contradicts that Adam named her Eve because she was the mother of all living. Evangelicals who cannot accept the plain text of the Bible regarding the creation of the first man from the dust of the ground often do not accept what the Bible says about the flood being global, because they accept the fossil layers as evidence for millions of years, not the result of the sequence of burial by a global flood. John Stott also wrote, The flood seems to have been a comparatively local, though widespread, disaster. Christian creationist anthropologist Marvin Lubinow describes the evidence of a sin nature in the allegedly pre-Adamic human fossil record, including examples of cannibalism and injury due to violence, scalping and disease, including syphilis. He writes, Most pre-Adamic and old earth advocates seem to be unfamiliar with the extent of this human fossil evidence and may not realize the full significance of what they are proposing when they place the bulk of the human fossils prior to the fall of the biblical Adam. The human fossil record reveals the pre-Adamite theory to be in error. We find in the human fossils the conditions we would expect to find after the fall of Adam, not before. Some Christians say that Adam was the first man to be made in the image of God, though there are also human-like creatures before him. More about this coming up after the break. Creationists like to point out that the fossil record is missing links for ape-to-man evolution, or dinosaur-to-bird. Honestly, where are all the transitional bones for any creature along their evolutionary journey? To go in-depth on the subject, you'll want to check out the great book titled Contested Bones. It's the result of more than four years of intense research into the primary scientific literature concerning those bones that are thought to represent transitional forms between ape and man. This book's title reflects the surprising reality that all the famous hominid bones continue to be fiercely contested today, even within the field of paleoanthropology. This book addresses a wide variety of important topics. Which, if any, of the species gave rise to man? Did Lucy's kind walk upright like modern humans did, or did they live among the trees like ordinary apes? Was Ardi the earliest human ancestor? What are the implications of the growing evidence that shows men coexisted with the Australopithecine apes? Are the dating methods consistently reliable? Can we be certain that man evolved from some kind of ape? This work is unique in that it is the most comprehensive, systematic, and up-to-date book available that critically examines the major claims about the various hominin fossils. Even though the book is technical, the book is accessible for a broad audience and engaging even for non-technical people. Contested Bones provides new insights regarding the history of paleoanthropology and the sequence of discoveries that bring us up to the current state of confusion within the field. The authors provide alternative interpretations of the hominin species. Surprisingly, the conclusions of the author consistently find strong support from various experts within the field. Contested Bones brings clarity to a fascinating but complex subject and offers refreshing new insights into how the pieces of the puzzle fit together and you'll find a copy for your personal library at creation.com slash store. Now, the Bible says nothing about the existence and death of any pre-Adamite creatures, either spirited or spiritless. Some Christians say that Adam was the first man to be made in the image of God, though there were also human-like creatures before him but they have assumed that the pre-Adamic fossils constitute a reliable record. That is, the fossils have been interpreted correctly in both anatomy and age. They are also in effect saying, number one, the first land animals and man were not created by God at the same time, namely during the 24 hours of day six of creation week, as Genesis chapter one clearly states. And two, that the short age timescale in Genesis obtained from the genealogies in other parts of the Bible, for example, Mark 10.6, is not correct. And number three, that the curse of death in the created world was not the result of Adam's sin, as Genesis 3 states. If pre-Adamite creatures were living and dying for hundreds of thousands or millions of years before Adam, then the connection is lost between the first Adam, which brought physical death into the world, and the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who brought physical resurrection from the dead. As Adam was federal head of the entire creation, 
his fall affected everything else. The fact is, biblically, all physical death has occurred since Adam's fall, not before. As sincere as they may be, those Christians who espouse the pre-Adamite theory and its history of death before Adam are actually endangering the very doctrine of salvation they hold dear. And fourthly, that the very good world which God created included carnivory, despite the Genesis chapter 1 29-30 teaching that animals and humans were originally vegetarian. The Bible tells us that Adam was the first biological man in the following. Genesis chapters 1 through 5, Deuteronomy 32, 8, 1 Chronicles 1, 1. You get the idea. It's described throughout the Bible. 1 Timothy 2, 13 and Jude 1, 14. So, how many parts of the Bible are they willing to concede as being errant or in need of reinterpreting in order to accommodate the evolutionary and uniformitarian interpretation of the fossil record? Hugh Ross and his fellow progressive creationists, along with the other pre-Adamite proponents, are trying to rescue the Bible from a perceived conflict with science by reinterpreting the Bible rather than by questioning the science. This is because they erroneously think that science speaks with more authority than God's word about origins and the age of the earth. Such a mindset overlooks the fact that where modern science deals with origins, it is based on strict naturalism. The humanistic view that all phenomena can be explained in terms of natural, not supernatural, causes and laws. Unfortunately, compromise of this sort means having to continually change one's position to keep up with evolutionary pronouncements. For example, Ross stated on his website in 1997, Starting about two to four million years ago, God began creating atom-like mammals or hominids. These creatures stood on two feet, had large brains, and used tools. Some even buried their dead and painted on cave walls. However, they were very different from us. They had no spirit. They did not have a conscience like we do. They did not worship God or establish religious practices. In time, all these man-like creatures went extinct. Then, about 10 to 25,000 years ago, God replaced them with Adam and Eve. Notice that Ross states that Adam and Eve lived 10 to 25,000 years ago. He realizes that he can't push the genealogies too far. However, when the same dating methods in which he trusts said that the Australian Aborigines and American Indians lived 4 to 60,000 years ago, he changed the sentence in the above quote to read, Then about 10 to 60,000 years ago, God replaced them with Adam and Eve. Presumably, the change was made because the 25,000 year limit would mean that the Aborigines and Indians could not have been descendants of Adam and Eve. However, his adjusted range of dates does not solve the problem. If it is possible that Adam and Eve lived 10,000 years ago, then this implies that it is possible that such indigenous people are not descendants of Adam and Eve, which would mean that they could not be saved through Christ, our kinsman redeemer. And no doubt, further adjustments will appear should some evolutionist claim that Aborigines lived 80 or 100,000 years ago. The same problem shows up in the writings of well-known Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer. He struggles with the same human skeletons dated by the secular methods that he and Ross trust in as older than could possibly fit into the genealogies in the Bible. Hence, their need for soulless pre-Adamites. Gleason writes, to revert to the problem of Pithecanthropus, the Swanscombe Man, the Neanderthal, and all the rest, it seems best to regard these races as all prior to Adam's time and not involved in the Adamic Covenant. We must leave the question open in view of the cultural remains whether these pre-Adamic creatures had souls. Gleason goes on to assert that only Adam and his descendants were infused with the breath of God and a spiritual nature corresponding to God himself, and to say that all mankind subsequent to Adam's time must have been literally descended from him. However, he retains the concept of pre-Adamic races, for example, Cro-Magnon man, and says, they may have been exterminated by God for unknown reasons prior to the creation of the original parent of the present human race. Scripture not science, is the ultimate test of all truth. And the further evangelicalism gets from that conviction, the less evangelical and more humanistic it becomes.
In reality, no scientific method exists for measuring the age of something directly. All dating methods rely on unprovable assumptions. And the evidence suggests there is something radically wrong with the assumptions upon which radiometric dating rests. Christians, when opting for dates in the Earth's fossil record, should use the chronology of the Bible. This is because it is an accurate eyewitness account of history which bears within itself the evidence that it is the Word of God. And Christians today have no mandate from God to reinterpret His infallible Word to make it fit any current, fallible, atheistic human opinions. As noted American evangelical theologian Dr. John MacArthur says, Scripture, not science, is the ultimate test of all truth. And the further evangelicalism gets from that conviction, the less evangelical and more humanistic it becomes. MacArthur also says, Evangelicals who accept an old earth interpretation of Genesis have embraced a hermeneutic, that is, interpretation, that is hostile to a high view of Scripture. They are bringing to the opening chapters of Scripture a method of biblical interpretation that has built in anti-evangelical presuppositions. Those that adopt this approach have already embarked on a process that invariably overthrows faith. Churches and colleges that embrace this view will not remain evangelical long. The Creation.com article podcast is hosted by me, Joseph Darnell, and produced out of the U.S. studio of Creation Ministries International. Learn more at creation.com. This episode was written by Russell Grigg. Our writers and scientists host a really cool talk show called Creation.com Talk, which you can find right here in your podcast app and YouTube. If you'd like to help us, become a monthly supporter using our donate page. You can also help us by telling your friends and family to check out our podcasts and creation.com. Be sure to follow Creation Ministries International on Facebook and Instagram, and subscribe to our free e-newsletter, Infobytes. From everyone at CMI, thanks for listening. <laughs>